Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. This is an educational channel where we uh, do deep dives on uh, some great theories of everything that you may not know about but wish you did. And um, we do theories of everything and all-encompassing theories and cosmologies and um, paradigm shifters things that you can apply to a holistic view of life and um, but they've been somewhat suppressed you're not supposed to know about them and um, today is our 399th video on the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson and uh, Mr. Larson was the originator of the reciprocal system of theory. This is a system of theory, meaning that you can apply it yourself once you learn its basic principles and operating procedure. And uh, Larson himself did apply uh, the reciprocal system to uh, chemistry and astronomy and physics, atomic physics, uh, also to economics and uh, many subjects uh, that were all in his book on metaphysics, including, uh, including um, psychology, philosophy, uh, religion, and uh, including things like dream interpretation, psychic phenomena. Uh, these are all under the purview and anything else if you wanted to uh, learn how um, you know underwater basket weaving um, you could use the reciprocal system to apply it to that also you just have to learn how the system works and how to apply it so um, we're gonna try to get into that a little bit here the basic idea uh, the basic ideas were put out by Larson in 1959 in his two fundamental postulates, two sentences uh, that expressed uh, to Larson's um, satisfaction how the universe operated. And then he took those two sentences or those two postulates and through a process of deduction, where he went, if this, then that. So if this, if if this, if this uh, postulate is correct, then these would be the um, results of that first thing being correct. If this is correct, then this would happen, and then this would happen, and then this would happen. And through a uh, a chain of deduction, about 165 steps that I went over about a year ago in about 15 different videos back then. Uh, they're all called the outline of the deductive development of the reciprocal system. If you want to go back and check those. Uh, he arrived at a theoretical universe. So this is Larson's theoretical universe, how the universe would look if his postulates are correct. And then in his books, he went through a process of comparing his theoretical universe with the actual universe of legacy science uh, that they have determined through measurements and observations in a laboratory or in an atom smasher or through a telescope. Um, and so they have published various scientific tables about, you know, the various properties of matter or the various properties of stars, galaxies, comets, you know, planets or whatever. Uh, and also, um, you know, various properties of the subatomic particles or the um, mesons or whatever it is. And Larson compared his um, theoretical findings with those of the mainstream scientists. And it turns out that Larson was able to almost recreate their findings just from his theory. 
Not in all cases, but in 90% of the cases or more. And so um, you got to figure he's on to something. But because his theory is so difficult to understand, because you have to think in a different way, and you have to kind of admit that certain things that you believed in were wrong, um, he has never really gotten a proper hearing. In some cases, he said he, he sent uh, free copies of his book out to all kinds of different scientists out there, all kinds of different publications that are out there. He said in some cases he felt like he received rejection letters before he even sent the book out. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, I actually went to see a physics uh, professor once about it. And the woman, uh, she basically kicked me out of her office um, after about five minutes, not even. It was office hours too, you know, so it wasn't like I was intruding on it. Uh, and, uh, she told me that I was lucky that she was so nice. And if I would have actually gone to the kind of the head of the department, he would have ripped me a new one is basically what she said. So, um, these people are not interested in the truth. They, they are, but they're, they're, they're too threatened by the truth when it kind of, um, starts to scratch at their own belief systems and their legacy and their salary, you know, um, they, they think that they're interested in the truth, but ultimately they, they're still kind of looking out for themselves and they don't see the big picture. They figure, most of them figure, you know, if, I, I'm a scientist. I, I go to conferences. I read the journals. I talk to people in the field. If I haven't heard of it yet, it's, it, it's a crackpot idea. That's basically what they think. I think that if they haven't heard of it already through their own, you know, channels, then it's, it's probably not worth looking at. I have too much stuff to look at in my own time. You know, I have too much stuff to look at to look at any old theory that comes down the pike. And unfortunately, they don't really understand the history of science because the history of science is filled with people from outside the profession. Science, scientists, so-called scientists, or what Larson would call uncommitted investigators, which you might look at that tomorrow, um, his concept of the uncommitted investigator. Um, but people outside the uh, discipline have provided the vast majority of the major uh, innovations and revolutions in the field, in every field, uh, but especially in the sciences. It's all the major innovations, the major changes that have come always come from outside the field. Okay, um, now, uh, Larson's two fu uh, fundamental postulates you've probably, probably been waiting on. Now, the uh, first postulate contains the, uh, does most of the, uh, you know, buttering of the bread, so-called. And uh, that is that the universe that we live in, the universe is composed entirely of one component. Motion. Existing in three dimensions, in uh, discrete units, and with two fundamental reciprocal, two reciprocal aspects, space and time. Okay, I would uh, more or less restate that, that, you know, the universe is not made out of matter, it's not made out of energy, it's not made out of force, uh, it's made out of motion. In fact, energy, matter, force, those are all forms of energy. I mean, forms of motion. And uh, in particular, they are forms of what he calls scalar motion. It's a motion that has a magnitude but has no direction. 
This is more generalized, like a non-localized kind of motion. And um, motion is the relationship between space and time. All motions are basically fractions with space or time as the numerator and time or space as the denominator. Time and space are reciprocals of one another, meaning that they have the identical qualities, but they have them in different order. And um, neither one of them exists in and of itself. They only exist together in motion. And um, they both have their scalar aspects, and they both have their coordinate aspects, meaning they both can take three dimensions. And uh, they, come, they both come only in discrete units. Motion only comes in discrete units. They are quantized. You have to have a full unit of space before you have any space. You have to have a full unit of time before you have any time. If you have one unit of space in one unit of time, you have uh, what Larson calls unit speed. One over one equals one. And that unit speed is also known as the speed of light. And so um, that's kind of the short version. And then the second postulate is the universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. Its primary magnitudes are absolute and its geometry is Euclidean. That postulate is not as important, but it is also under dispute from many of Larson's followers who don't like the Euclidean geometry aspect of it. They feel like that is limiting, not incorrect, but limiting. And um, some have had problems with the commutative mathematics as well and the uh, primary magnitudes. So um, there are alternative versions of those postulates. Larson revised his postulates a few different times over the years. At, the, at first, he began with the term space-time rather than motion, then changed that to motion. Eventually, he also articulated the term um, change in three dimensions. So that might give you an idea of what he's talking about with that. Um, anyway, we are going to read his article today that might shed some more light on these postulates. Uh, the article is called After 3,000 Years. Over the past several years, this journal has published a series of articles by Dr. KVK Nehru entitled The Space-Time Universe, which describe a new theory of the physical universe that I originated. These articles have given a good account of the fundamentals of the theory, but many readers may have wondered how we can justify the extent of departure from currently accepted thought that is involved in some of our conclusions. At the invitation of the editor, I am therefore undertaking to supplement Dr. Nehru's presentation with some comments on the general structure of the theory and the consideration the considerations that led to its formulation. The most significant feature of this new development is that it is a general physical theory, one in which the basic laws and principles of all physical fields are derived from a single set of fundamental postulates without making any further assumptions of any kind and without introducing anything from any outside source. Construction of such a theory has been a major goal of science for 3,000 years, and an immense amount of time and effort has been devoted to the task. But until now, all of these efforts have been totally unsuccessful. The failure has not been a matter of arriving at the wrong answers. Previous investigators have not been able to formulate any single theory that would give them any answers right or wrong. To more than a mere handful of the millions of questions that a general physical theory must answer. 
As a result, present-day physical theory is not a single integrated structure, but a multitude of parts and pieces which, as the physicists admit, do not fit together very well. Every conclusion derived from currently accepted theory rests on hundreds, if not thousands, of separate assumptions. There will no doubt be considerable argument before final conclusions are reached as to whether or not the answers that are obtained from our theoretical development are correct. But the fact that cannot be denied is that the new theory does produce the answers to physical questions on the wholesale scale that is required for a full coverage of the physical field. Thus, after thousands of years of battle uh, of futile attempts, we have finally succeeded in producing a general physical theory. The question as to how this result was accomplished, therefore, becomes a matter of scientific interest, regardless of the ultimate outcome of the controversies regarding the validity of the conflicting answers. The reason for the inability to construct a general physical theory in the early days of science is quite simple. The amount of detailed knowledge about physical phenomena then available was totally inadequate to serve as a base for the necessary chain of inductive reasoning. Over the long years that followed, this deficiency was gradually overcome by the labors of thousands of scientists who piece by piece built up the kind of a structure of observational and experimental knowledge that was necessary. But before this structure was complete, another factor had entered into the situation. The members of the scientific community had grown impatient with the slow pace of the standard scientific procedure and had turned their attention to developing means of circumventing the restrictions imposed by that established procedure. The fundamental strategy of most of these um, evasive devices is to substitute absence of disproof for the proof of validity that is required to meet scientific standards. The ad hoc assumption, the most widely used of these expedients, is a good example. In traditional scientific practice, when the consequences of the basic postulates of a theory are developed and one or more of them is found to conflict, with the results of observation or measurement, the theory is invalidated. But the ad hoc assumption provides a means of evading this contradiction of the empirical results. For instance, the currently accepted theory of atomic structure postulates that one of the constituents of the atom is the observed particle known as the neutron. But the neutron, as we know, as we know it, is unstable, with a life of no more than about 15 minutes. Since a stable atom cannot be constructed of unstable constituents, strict scientific practice would require rejecting the existing atomic theory. But the theorists have nothing to put in its place and they are unwilling to go through the long and laborious process of developing an entirely new theory. So they have called upon the ad hoc assumption. They have assumed, purely arbitrarily, that the neutron becomes stable when it enters the atomic structure. There is no physical evidence to support this assumption. But since the interiors of the atoms are observationally inaccessible, there is no known way of disproving the assumption either. In today's liberal climate, the theorists are allowed to take this absence of disproof as the equivalent of proof. This elevation of absence of disproof for 
uh, to the status of the principal criterion of validity has inevitably had the result of encouraging speculation at the expense of inductive reasoning. The farther a hypothesis departs from physical reality, the less opportunity there is to refute it by comparison with the results of observation or measurement. Thus, the easy route to something that the theorist can publish is to increase the speculative content of the work and to decrease the factual content. The eventual eventual result of this policy can be seen in the currently fashionable practice of finding explanations for all sorts of astronomical phenomena in assumptions involving black holes. Since the black hole itself is purely hypothetical, it can be introduced into the theory of almost any kind of physical phenomena without any concern on the part of the theorist that some inconvenient fact might invalidate his product. The second general class of expedients for evading the difficult task of constructing theories that can be verified by standard scientific methods is based on the assumption that whatever scientists have not thus far been able to do cannot be done. When expressed in this manner, this proposition is an obviously preposterous, is, is so obviously preposterous that most scientists will no doubt deny that they ever make any such assumption. But again and again, in present day scientific discourse, we are told that all possible alternatives have been examined and that the preferred one of these must be accepted. In spite of any shortcomings to which it may be subject, because there is no other way Einstein relied heavily on this argument in his work. In the case of high-speed motion, for instance, he tells us that, quote, if the velocity of light is the same in all coordinate systems, then moving rods must change their length. Moving clocks must change their rhythm. There is no other way, end quote. But it is evident that such an assertion can be valid only if all of the factors that enter into the situation have been fully taken into account. Since it is seldom, if ever, possible to be certain that this has been accomplished, the no other way argument is clearly untenable. One of the important factors involved in motion at high speeds is the question as to the nature of space and time. Since present day ideas on this issue, particularly those with respect to time, are no more than vague impressions, quote, primitive undefined concepts, as one prominent physicist called them, the assumption of complete understanding implicit in Einstein's assertion that there is no other way, is an absurdity. Our finding that there actually is another way, one that involves the existence of a second time component, merely emphasizes a fallacy that should have been evident even without further investigation. Obviously, the evasive measures that have been devoted, uh, that have been devised in order to avoid having to meet the strict requirements of standard scientific practice, move physical theory away from the truth rather than toward it. The big increase in the amount of available empirical information that has taken place during the present century has therefore contributed little, if anything, to progress toward the goal of a general physical theory. What should have been a steady advance in understanding has been turned into a series of 
excursions into the land of the imagination. From the foregoing analysis of the situation, it should be evident that what is needed in order to take advantage of the entire store of accumulated factual knowledge in the search for a general physical theory is to cease using methods of avoiding the lack of meeting the requirements for verification of hypotheses and to return to a strict, com strict compliance with these requirements. This is the policy that was adapted at the start of the investigation that ultimately led to the formulation of the theory of the universe of motion. No conclusion was accepted on anything more than a tentative basis unless and until it was able to meet the standard test of validity. No ad hoc assumptions were employed and nothing was accepted on the strength of assertions that there is no other way. Of course, this return to sound scientific procedure did not guarantee success. As stated earlier, a certain level of factual knowledge had to be attained before reasoning could be effectively applied. But, as it turned out, the necessary, the necessary information had been accumulated and was available for use. A long and intensive study of that information was required, but eventually a general physical theory emerged. Those who read Dr. Nehru's articles or one of my books will find that the theory calls for some more substantial changes in currently accepted physical concepts that then would ordinarily be expected in any one new theory. But it should be kept in mind that the theory of the universe of motion is not just another theory. It is a unique product, the only general physical theory ever devised. And uh, like a lot of Larson's papers, they kind of leave you uh, looking for more. I wish Larson would have written a few uh, a few more paragraphs explaining what he is talking about and, um, you know, kind of fleshing some of it out. But a lot of times Larson just kind of leaves you high and dry. So, um, but it's still, um, I think, informative to look at the history of science and look at the way that these scientists are formulating these theories and uh, some of the... Uh, shaky procedures that they're using um, in order to kind of kick the can down the road, make it seem like we know what we're talking about, make it seem like we're making progress. Meanwhile, we're just kind of making stuff up. Um, and as you probably can see, if you're uh, paying attention to current events, this process has bled into the generalized discourse and political philosophy of this country and probably the world in general. Uh, they just kind of make stuff up. They kind of brush things under the rug. They kind of pretend that they don't exist. They use all kinds of very shaky procedures uh, that uh, they put under the name of science. And, uh, you know, they just kind of kick the can down the road and hope that you know, uh, our, um, you know, successors or our future, um, you know, by the time we get to the future, maybe we'll have come up with something that will, um, you know, cover, uh, cover it up a little bit more or maybe even deal, actually deal with the problem. So, you know, ultimately, that's why I, I like Larson's theory. Uh, you know, I can't vouch for everything that he says, but it is a general physical theory. It provides answers to any question that you have. And so it's worth looking at because it's not doing what these other theories are doing. It's not kicking the can down the road. It's not making stuff up as we go along. It's not uh, trying to be evasive and pretending like we know more than we do. 
It's actually facing the problem straight ahead, uh, you know, straight up and saying, okay, these are all the problems that we have. How are we going to tackle them? You know, there is a lot of, uh, you know, shit shoveling that has to be done for us to bail ourselves out of all these various situations that have been created by, you know, various corrupt people in positions of power. And in order to do them, do that, we have to dig ourselves out. There's no way around it. You know, uh, there's not going to be a magic pill, uh, magic this or that. We have to face up and look at it and deal with it. And so this is a start. This is, this is a shovel, you know. It's not going to be easy, but at least this is, something, this is a tool that we can use to do the job. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be backbreaking, and it doesn't mean that it's, you know, um, you know, going to smell like roses. But at the same time, it's a start. It's a very, very solid start. You know, it's but like getting a, a, a really good shovel that's not going to break, and that's not going to go bad on you, and that you can use it for your shoveling. Okay, um, we will... Uh, move on to our next episode tomorrow and i think we might try to look at that article that larson has called the uncommitted investigator which talks about how you know a little bit about the story of some of the innovations and revolutions that have occurred in science and where they came from in the meanwhile thanks for tuning in and have a